The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. This podcast is proudly brought to you by Franklin Templeton. Shifting financial markets are providing new opportunities for fixed income investing. At Franklin Templeton, we have a 50-year history as a global leader investing in fixed income markets and a strong track record of navigating market cycles. We offer investors a comprehensive range of active fixed income solutions managed by our seasoned specialist investment teams to help find opportunities in global and local markets. For yield, diversification and performance, Partner with Franklin Templeton to help elevate your approach to fixed income. Connect with us today at franklintempleton.com.au. Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I've got Nathan Fradley with me today. Nathan, I reckon you, I'll have to ask Kieran afterwards, are are you like the number one repeat Repeat offender. Cast guest. Repeat. Repeat vendor. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Uh, I, I reckon lots of lots of people will know you. But Nathan, what are you what are you up to now? You uh you broke the LinkedIn on on Monday when you posted a bit of a video. And uh, <laughs> what are you doing with yourself? Now? Yeah. So um I finished up um at Tribeca uh at the time of this recording a week ago. Um so ba- basically in short um if everyone knows around ethos and the and the business that um I've got on I suppose to the side work in that sort of weekend, some one day a week uh, for the last little bit, but it's growing quite rapidly and it, it demands more of my time. So I was working with with Ryan, Tasha and Rob and working through different scenarios, like how can we make this work, dropping days, all that kind of stuff, um, while still being uh, useful um, and reliable, which is always the two things you want to be when you're working with, with great people. You never want to let people down. Uh, and we kind of just realized, mm, knowing me the way I am too, you, uh, is it's like, well, is this actually going to work or is this going to end up being, you know, something that we en- you know, have to re- unwind or fix up later? And so we, we had some really good discussions around it and then we're like, you know what, let's just, let's just bite the bullet. So, um, yeah, so I finished up there, but I couldn't give up advice. I don't it's, know what it is. It's just, it, it went, if you're an advisor, you're an advisor, right? Um, and so I was like reflecting on, you know, what do I love about it? What do I really enjoy doing? And a lot of my time at Tribeca was spent like with the other advisors helping helping them. I brought in quite a few referrals. So I would be, you know, distributing them out as well and sort of picking two or three cases a quarter that I'd be working on. I was like, well, can I do that myself? Mm-hmm. And that's kind of where the, the idea came about. So it was like, well, keep doing what I do, which is, you know, highly specialist advice for occasional, you know, occasional cases, but and get to keep doing that, get to keep working with other advisors. You know, these are the things I want to keep doing. How do I structure it? And my wife being uh, in litigation, I know the the workings of the barrister model quite well. And I sort of looked to that and I was like, I actually think that that can apply in, in the financial advice world. And anyone who listens to um, to Jordan and my potty will know we're big fans of niching and, and really getting specialized. And so looking at that and saying, well, okay, if I want to specialize and I want to do it like a barrister, what do barristers do? And they do... They do four things, and I'm going to do three of them. Um, the one I'm not going to do is I'm not going to court. <laughs> so, hopefully not anyway. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to be cross-examining anyone. Um, I have I have done evidence work before, but I oh. yeah I've done I've done expert evidence for work before, and I would I would do that again, but I would not do it on the stand. I would not be cross-examined. Thank you. <laughs> it's yeah. not for me. Um, but I um yes, yeah, so I was like okay. Well, what else do they do? They either um appear. In, in appointments, they, yeah, so they'll be brought in in cases where the complexity is higher than the solicitor's capability, um, and they'll come in as the expert in that meeting. They'll give some guidance. Um, they'll work with the solicitor behind the scenes. So, hey, can you help me with this thing that we're working on? Um, or they will, what they call draft, they'll do advice. Um, and obviously, there's increasing levels of involvement. Very similar to what we can do here. Yes. So, I can... You know, James, you could have a, a case come along that is, let's say, it's an HK case or something like that, and you're like, "Look, I, I don't know if it's if they need advice, but they've got a problem. I'm going to get you know get Nathan in, 
So bring me in on an hourly rate. I come into the meeting. I can help their questions, delay some of their fears, get them to understand where they stand, you know, where they're at, whether they need to do anything right now. And then that's that's handled and it's dealt with. And for you, you've got you build that relationship with the client, but you don't have to be the expert in everything. Um, and I think there's a space for that in so many different areas of, of what we do in advice. Mm. Um, so I thought, well, I'll put my money where my mouth is and I'll give it a crack myself. Mm. It was interesting. Like I watched a video on on Monday and I I was really impressed that, like, you had everything lined up. Like, you you a you you put your video say, "Hey, I'm going to do my own thing now, and it's going to be like this barrister type model, like you've just articulated." But and then, like, you could go through to your website and like it had you had like you had everything ready to go. It's like, did did you did you do all of that yourself? Did you get someone to help you do all of that? Uh, no, hundred percent me. Yeah, um, I thought it was. <laughs> just just so, knowing you, I thought this. The, I thought you would love to be getting in and building your website and doing your video and doing the editing and all the rest of it. It's the the creative side I really enjoy. Um, it's yeah. actually um, interestingly like finishing out with Tribeca and kind of talking to everyone and Lisa, um, who's the head of marketing at Tribeca, and um, and she was like, "Would you be interested in like working with us in future?" And I was like, "Yeah." Like I do, I do stuff with like their video or like marketing stuff. Like I I really enjoy that part. Yes. And I've had, you know, being able to do that. Um, when you, when I when I moved across into Tribeca, I went from trying to do everything in a business to be able to truly realize where I, what I enjoy about advice, what I love about coaching and mentoring and leading people. And also I still got to scratch that creative itch. So yeah, 100%. This was like, it was three month notice period. So I've had sort of three months of design. Yeah, building going stuff. this. Yeah, yeah. Re- reiterations, you know, different, like, like the logo that I've made, like I made it. Um, the color schemes designed that myself, website I built myself, video, all the rest of it. There's a bit at the end of the video where I'm like, we good? Um, yeah, there's yeah, no I, one else in the room. <laughs> I, I always said, I'm like, did he mean to leave that bit in there? Like, Absolutely. like it's, it's common for people to do that whole walking towards the video and switching the camera bit off. I'm like, did he, did he mean to leave that in there or not? 100% deliberate because it, it, it's like takes away from the seriousness of the video. But also there was no one else there. Like it's yeah. just me. But it's, it's just you in the in the room where you're sitting now, where where we're recording, where you're recording the podcast. hundred hundred percent. I'm just staring into nothingness. Um, but that's all. I think that's. I mean, classically in 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 marketing, that's all part of it, right? It's like yeah. there's there's the message you're trying to get across and how you deliver that, and then there is you know and why you're trying to do that, hmm. and then there is the substance. And in this instance, yeah, there's no one there, but it immediately kind of like brings it down a little bit. Yeah, as sort of a finisher. So yeah, very deliberate. I'm sure I'm not the only one that's gone, huh? Like, like you just at the end, you're like, huh? What? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Pulls so you back like out. Not the because it's quite professional up until that point. Like you're sitting there, and you, you know you've got the yeah. So yeah, I'm yeah. As I said, I'm not surprised that that it was you, and and quite clearly quite deliberate to say, you know, I'm, I'm sure that obviously people at Tribeca and maybe others knew what what you were up to, but when you've kind of made that announcement to the broader financial advice industry to then have everything line up on day one to say, hey, I'm doing this. And then there's all the information in your website and everything ready to go. So clearly quite yeah. deliberate and worked well. Yeah. And, and that's also deliberate on knowing myself. Um, you know, one thing that I've gained from working with the team and there is, um, particularly with Ryan, is learning a lot about me and how I work. Um, you know, we've done sessions with like Vanessa Bennett on uh, from the NEP, literally changed my life. Um, can't talk about that highly enough. Yeah, really? uh, yeah oh, like mm-hmm. genuinely. I think, I think I mentioned her on a Challenge to Center podcast like every second episode. Um, cause just so, um, the, 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 the way they talk about things like energy credits and heavy and light duties and timing of that, like I've rearranged my entire day and, and completely changed my life. And then the way I work, I knew while I was excited. I focused on the transition, but I did little bits on weekends around the creative stuff, yep. which meant I could do it in bits and pieces, which creative work never, uh, it, sometimes you just have times where it works and other times it doesn't work. Mm. So you can't just count, I'll do all of that on Tuesday and then expect your brain to be able to do that on Tuesday. Um, so being able to sort of bleed it on the way also helped me refine that message, refine that, you know, that logo. Um, so many things go into that kind of stuff. And I think that was, that was a good lead up for me, but then also hitting the ground running this week, like being self-employed again, it's thrown me. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, yeah, what am I doing? It says, it's been a good day. Have I been productive? What's mm-hmm. happening? So, like, so to have that already done instead of scrambling now to do it, big difference. Yeah. Yeah. And did you, like, do you find that you're a, 
you're like you, you need to focus deep on one thing at a time, or or can you manage lots of different things at, at a point in time? Like you're talking about the creative part, and maybe the idea is kind of simmering in your head, mm. but but outside of that, do you need to just kind of block out everything and go, okay, I'm I'm all in on ethos for the time being, or you can bounce around different things? I think. I, I have a naturally a fast pace, so I need to do short stints on things mm. um, and, and, and a creative personality type. So, yeah. um, you know, it, I just happen to be in financial advice, but I'm naturally a creative. So I think when, if I've got to find this balance, which is this constant battle where when it's happening, I've got to do it, yeah. but I've also got to have structures in place that ensure that I'm doing the other things when I need to, you know, and that's. That's what I said about largely like the NEP stuff that we do with Vanessa, like what times of day I should be doing the things that are very heavy to me is really important. So I do all my admin stuff in the morning and I structure my day like that. So I'm, I mean, working with the US, I'm starting at kind of five, five thirty because mm-hmm. then I've got US time. I've got time to talk to those guys. Um, I kind of work until I take my wife to the station, come back, and then I'll kick off with some, you know, more, um, creative stuff. And in the afternoon, I'll do like the podcasting or like meetings and so, because that's when it's best for me. Yeah. Um, and if I do that well, then I'm, I, I really nail the day. When I don't, um, and I'm sure people can appreciate this, you get to the end of the day and you're trying to do like things that are quite heavy or hard, but not necessarily hard tasks. For me, it's administrative things, but I just can't do them. I get distracted. That's when I jump around and then I feel bad. And then that creates kind of like that cycle, right? So it's like, how do, you, how do I get myself really well placed to be able to split my time? Because now I'm working a lot on ethos and on advice. And an ethos with what we've got coming in the future, it's going to be longer lead times, bigger projects, kind of build up of work, and then it slows down, build up work and slows down. So then the advice will kind of taper into that. Yep. So being really, really self-aware, um, I've got a great support with, with my wife. She's going to keep a close eye on my work habits, but also like Jordan, who's licensed me, he's going to keep a close eye and be like, Nathan, I think you're doing too much advice or Nathan, you should be doing a little bit more advice. So, you know, I've got really good supports around me, which is really important as well. So yeah. it is, it is a very, it's a balancing act, especially with my personality. Cause I can just go nuts on things. Um, and when it's, I, I, there's a, the way I describe the, my ideas is that I am like I'm by my nature an idiot, um, and I have a muse or a patron of some description that just like when it feels like it just pours genius into my brain, and it, I just can't believe what comes out of my mouth sometimes. And then I'm like, I'm back to the idiot me again, where I can't even tie my shoelaces. Um, I still do bunny ears, James, so I literally don't know how to tie my shoelaces. So um, yeah, it's 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 always a funny thing. Sometimes you got to strike while the iron's hot. Yeah, I would, I'm interested. Like in the in the video, you, you spoke about. Um like the traditional model of financial advice is collect all of these clients up and you charge them an ongoing kind of fee and that that you have this kind of baseline of ongoing revenue and some new clients coming in. You're moving away from that. Are you purposely purposely not wanting to have ongoing relationships with clients? Yes, and for two separate reasons. It's a three. Reason where you, what, what, the, yeah, three. what are the reasons? So one of them is time obligation um, that I've got – I, I've got this opportunity with Ethos to grow this business, and I, and, and as anyone would know, being one of the reasons it's really hard to be a part-time advisor is you're not available when your clients necessarily need you, right? Yes. So being able to work with people when I can say yes for the next three months we can work together, but if I am, you know, traveling with Ethos or doing working on a big project or a product launch, or then for this period of time I can't take on a client. That's fine for upfront only. Or, or, or episodic advice, but when you have an ongoing client, your your life is also dictated by your client's lives, mm. and that's by its nature why we do this, right? We we love that. Um, so that part of it, I don't want to have, I don't want to let people down because of that obligation. The other part is, I suppose, a joy aspect. I really enjoy the initial part of the process, bringing them on. Um, don't get me wrong; I've had clients for thirteen years. I love seeing them every year and the rest of it. But I find that most of my cup is filled in that first part. Yeah. setting them up, getting that, bringing down the temperature in complex situations, making things this simple and easy. And then, yeah, so like off you go. Now I know there's going to be a lot of circumstances where the people I work with will need ongoing advice from that point. Very different to the style of advice I'd given them to then. And so then it's going to be a matter of of transitioning them over. And I had like a really good example of that when I left Tribeca is that I brought this client on. It was a, a, a complex estate you know, do I challenge the world? Why not? Um, emotional complexity, family complexity, like like ideal kind of client. 
and we work through all of that and, you know, working with the accountant and the lawyer and the professional executor and da, 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 and got all the way to the money in the, in the account invested, ready to go. Yeah. And then one of the advisors at Tribeca, Matt, took her over. But those last few meetings, he came into the meetings, he worked with her, he built that trust. And then I was able to just leave the room and she's connected with him quickly. Everything's great. And he's the right kind of person for her ongoing. And I think that I can replicate that in those circumstances as well. So then I get to work with lots of other advisors, which I really enjoy doing, yep. um, and get the right person to the client, um, which which I think is also you know really powerful as well. Mm. And then the then the downfall of that type of model, you have to constantly be chasing new work. Yes, if if that's you know, you've got two different jobs in for in in a sense. But to then make that model work in financial advice, you've got to constantly keep chasing the work. Yeah, and I don't have a business. Hmm. So this is kind of like when I was designing the model and I was trying to come up with a name for a business and da 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 da, da and, and Michael Miller said to me, he said, what are you doing? Like, you, you're it. Which, like, it seems really self-serving to have, like, a, a nathanfradley.com.au email. It's like, some people might find me uh, overly confident and arrogant, but I find it irritating. I have to have my own domain name. <laughs> but it's like, but, like, I am the brand, but there's also nothing to sell. So, you know, I'm not building an asset. Um, I'm not building a, a, a something, or, you know, a, equity in something, which when you're going into financial advice and you're building a business, that's what you want to do. You want to build up this client base. You want to get, I think, probably overstated is how like comfortable you can become because people will tend to grow their client base and then hand off clients and, and constantly evolve and add new clients and, and grow the book. But it is. It's an ongoing revenue stream. It's it's easier to to as a business owner to have ongoing re- re- revenue than it is to bring on new clients. You don't have to worry about when the next one's coming. I'm not concerned when the next one's coming, which makes it gives me the ability to do this. Mm. If, if that makes sense. So, um, I mean, like I get from my network and and I, I generate quite a num- number of referrals as it is. So I'm not concerned with getting referrals in. Um, the kind of people I want to, I'm going to work with won't necessarily be the case, and I'll be referring most people out. But I think you're right when, in terms of the the challenge, if there's someone thinking, oh, I want to, I like this kind of model, it's mm-hmm. going to be a grind forever. Like in in that sense, if you want to make full time money and build staff and pay rent and build a business like that, you're always looking for new business. That's not saying you can't do it. How many other businesses do that? We're very rare uh, our our business type in having recurring revenue of clients in in our industry. It's not a usual normal thing for businesses. Um, you know, even our mates over in accounting don't do that. They just have they have clients that keep coming back, but they're not on necessarily always on retainers. So I think yeah, it's different. Um, and my and people might be like, oof, no, nah, not for me. Great. Um, but it works for me. Um, and if I can show people that can be done. Those that you know, because it becomes a lot of obligation in running that client book. You know, both personal. Say, you, get in, and, you, you get into the whole ongoing service agreements, and you just, did you do the number of reviews that you said you were going to do? And if you didn't, then yeah, like you got a refund fees, and yeah, it's, it's um, a whole thing. And do yeah, you, do, that, that do they whole, need it? Do they need a review that year? Completely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it does remove a lot of that compliance aspect, which also removes a lot of my time obligation. Um, so. Yeah, it, it allows me to be more efficient. Obviously, you know, being no staff, just me, um, I'm going to, oh, I'm, uh, I've got, I'll have my outsourced administrative work, but I'm not having to manage that myself. It's, I just have to worry about seeing clients, doing best by them, and then sending them on their way when they're when I'm when I'm finished working with them, and that's that's great for me. Do you see yourself like like actually doing statements of advice and delivering advice, or more? coming to a meeting with me and helping me help the client and I'm the one that's delivering the statement of advice at the end of the day versus your, like, what do you think that might look like? The answer to that is yes. I'm going to do both. Yep. So Jordan and I have already started working on the video SOA aspect of, of, of the license and building out the policies around that so that we can deliver advice uh, in, in really, really client friendly manner. Um, and then, and then I, so I can go out and do what I need to do there. It will depend on demand. Like if people, if if I've got advisors ringing me a couple of times a week saying, hey, can you come to this meeting or jump on Zoom to this meeting and I can help a bunch of people, then I'll do that. I think it'll also depend on the licensee. The working with, with you guys where you've probably got a little bit more give into how, how you can work to that versus working with some other licensees where we don't. It's like, well, you know, does that, that advisor have to do a full statement of advice 
to take on that client in the first place. Okay, well, how do we make this as efficient and easy so the client has a smooth process? There's not two SOA presentations. There's not this duplication. There's, it's going to depend on the advisor I'm working with as well. Um, so, and and remembering too, James, I'm going to get, I'm going to be getting my own you know, clients being referred directly to me as well. So people are going to come in and go, hey, I've got this, I'm in this situation, I'm receiving this inheritance. Um, the executives are fighting, what do we do? I'll work with them directly and give statements of advice to them directly True. Um, as well. But it, I think I'm, I'm interested to see what happens. I'm interested to see if I do start getting phone calls from people and saying, hey, we're working on this case, can you help? Or we, yeah, I've got this question, can you help? Or um, which I'm used to doing in my day-to-day work, working in a larger organization, um, or if that doesn't happen at all and it's just me working on my own clients. I can see the model being really attractive to the likes of accountants and lawyers and things that that may very well come across these complicated cases. Uh, it, it, like, you'll have people that maybe somewhat call you out of the blues somehow. They found mm. you on Google or whatever. But you know that those kind of traditional accounting lawyer type referrals. I, I think the the model of hey, I'll help them with this job and I'll charge a particular fee for this job and then the job is over. I could see that being really attractive to them because that's the model that they operate on anyway. Mm. And and so you kind of will you in, you do the job, you deliver the advice, you do whatever you need to do, helping with the restructure, and then you and then you move on. Yeah, I think they're also knowing intrinsically the process of advice and the value of ongoing advice. I'm I'm definitely not going to err away from if I go in and do that. And maybe the accountant or the lawyer doesn't really understand that value proposition, but for that client, it's important. I will 100% ensure that client gets in front of the right advisor as well, like because I I get that it's just not what I do. So, um, which is also a good in, right? Like that's a good if if. If an hourly rate is familiar to a law to a lawyer, um, and then they get transitioned over to a, to an ongoing retainer based model with a great financial advisor, then the lawyer can see that process unfold. Then they're more comfortable with it. They can explain it to their clients better, and their relationships improve. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to follow along to see how it goes for you. It 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 sounds like a really good model for someone that has a high volume of new client work coming their way. It's not for the advisor that's sitting there looking after a book that gets two or three new clients a year. It's just not going to work. You're going to you're going to starve to death. But uh, but yeah, where you've got a network like you do, whether it's advisors, accountants, wherever the work is coming from, where you've got that that type of referral network coming in, you can make it work. Mm. And referral network going out, which mm. is just as important because I know when I run my own practice, I try to do everything all the time. Um, where I'm so well defined now, that's good for me because I can say I will say no, but I will make sure that person gets the right advisor. Mm. Um, you know, so continuing to build that network, find people who are who work with different kinds of people. Um, then it's like I, I've met you. If I've talked for fifteen minutes. Here are two or three advisors, or here's the advisor I think is the best fit for you. Go and speak to them. Um, yeah. Yep. Interesting. Exciting times, James. Exciting you've times. done. Yeah. You've look. You've had. You know. You've you've had. You, you've worked in a few, like you've been on your own before doing everything yourself, this model of collecting clients up and having a book of clients. Yeah. Tribeca with a bit of a bigger business and seeing, you know, team structures and, and, and odds and all the rest of it to then do something different. So it's like, I'm sure you're probably just kind of cherry picking the best bits of the different things that you've worked in to uh, to give this one a crack. 100%. 100%. I'd, I'd say... Sometimes, like, my career was fairly condensed. I did, like, 100 appointments in my first three months of being an advisor. Um, I set myself that goal and I did 100 appointments, your first appointments, SOA presentations, all the rest of it. Um, I saw a lot of clients. When, at Lyme, I grew my business very quickly. So I, 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 I feel like I've had a 30-year career in 15 years. Um, and from that, it's like, okay, well, what do you love? You know, I feel like, you know, that, you know when you get that uh, former exec client come to you, James, and they're like, I want to retire. I think I'm going to go into consulting. I feel like I was at yeah, that point of my career. <laughs> or board work. I'm going yeah, to go to boards or I'm going to do consulting. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm doing like right now. Thing. Yeah. The thing is they do it too. They all they all do it. Um, they all yeah. they will retire and then, yeah, two months later where they used to work, oh, we've got this project. Can you come and work for three months and we'll pay you X amount? Yeah, sure. No worries. Yeah. When, what do they say when you jump and it will appear? Yeah, that's yeah. always the case, right? Yeah. yeah. And, so, and so Ethos, what are your plans with Ethos? Maybe we'll round out a bit on... On we've got, what you're up to there. We've got some pretty big stuff coming this year. I can't yeah. talk about it too much yet, but um, yeah. I'm 
now I will have the time and capacity to do a lot more in that space. So, you know, we've built out from a financial advice product now to an institutional product. Uh, so I've got some pretty major uh, names meeting coming up pretty soon where we're going to go through effectively one of the challenges fund managers have behind the scenes is getting the great work they do in stewardship and active you know, active ownership and, and voting across to the analysts to inform their decisions and vice versa. And, the, the, you know, you'd be horrified to find out how many billions of dollars are managed on spreadsheets. Um, so we're trying to softwareify all of these problems. And so that's really exciting. And then what that allows us to do is then further develop the advice side, which is, you know, I'm going to be able to do more content. We're going to be able to partner with people like Alexander Brown to deliver you know, more educational content in RIA. We, we're talking to those guys, like people who are in this space working together to deliver more, I suppose, CPD stuff, educational content, useful stuff. Um, one thing that I um, will be will be launching pretty pretty soon, I can definitely say this one, is like just a quarterly Zoom meeting that anyone can jump into that's about upgrading your internal investment philosophy to include your ESG philosophy. Because if you can get that right, it removes a lot of ambiguity in the advisor's decision-making process. It's like, this is how we do it here. Um, and for most clients, it's fine. And so, But you've got it embedded. So things like that, I can start delivering a lot more of, which for me... Um, you know, I, I'm, I love giving back to the, the advice industry. I felt like, you know, it's too early to get off the train yet and uh, there's a lot of work to be done. So I'm going to pick up a shovel and get in there and these are the areas that I can help. Yeah. Is there a risk profiling type tool in there as well? Uh, we've talked about it. We could easily add it in, um, mm. to be honest. Like if if that's something that was, you know, that came in demand where you basically, you put your questions in, um, we could do that very easily. Um, yeah. So if that's something that people like, hey, actually, that'd be really cool if you could just do the risk profile and then click off that to the, ES, the, the ESG questionnaire if they want to and use that as a risk profiling tool, we could. Um, we don't store a lot of client information in the system, so it does change a couple of dynamics in doing it, but it's easy enough. Um, yeah. You know, People have asked us, could you make it a fact find tool and all the rest of it? We wouldn't go that far. It's not what we do. Uh, and there's already plenty of other great solutions out there. We'll just integrate with them instead. It's like I was one of the... Ensemble PD days a little while back. I one of, one of the ethical fund managers was presenting, and and I had I was the like the interviewer person at the end, mm-hmm. doing the, the questions from from the audience, and I kind of raised this like, like the, the the general feedback that came through on the on the on the questions was that advisors feeling like clients don't care, and then like even in our risk profiling questionnaire, like we have one question that's you know something along the lines of do you have any major ethical social considerations, those kind of things that you want us to take into account when we're making investment recommendations to you. And 80, the, the particular way that I asked the question, more than 80% of clients say no, and then we kind of just kind of just move on. Uh, you've challenged me on that you know, uh, kind of off a podcast before. Um, yes, I think there's, there's, there's more work that people can be doing in that space, I guess, to 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 really get to what people want to do, maybe the answer is no, and that's fine, and you move on. But maybe yeah, it, there is better ways we can be asking those questions. I, I think what we fundamentally forget is, and this goes the risk profile is a clear example of this. If someone comes in and they're in their thirties and they fill out the risk profile questionnaire, um, and they come in as conservative, are you going to leave them as conservative no. for their superannuation? Right. No. So, so so much of what we do is in education. If you say, what are your goals? That, that, if that's your question, you're going to get jack out, right? If you take them on a journey of, okay, let's talk about 10 years from now, where do you see yourself living, da, da, you're going to get a far different outcome. Um, so like when James O'Reilly um, from Northeast went through this process, um, they, they he basically very, very data-driven, just asked the question, is this something you want to consider? And when he started asking uh, of these areas, what's important to you, everyone selected stuff all the time. But when he said, is there anything important to you open-ended, people didn't select things. So the way we ask and the way we educate is going to be hugely important on that. The broad research shows that, like, and Ria um, reaffirm this every year, it's about 90% of people expect that this consideration is to be placed anyway. Um, consideration is very different to priority. And I think even now more so than, say, in 2020, we saw this huge uplift in demand in 2020 because you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You, if, you're, if you're home, you're safe. Um, for people who were, were were working, were getting you know j- um, job job keeper and all that kind of stuff, there was this level of savings habits and security that came along with that. Maybe their social needs weren't being met on a five k radius, but you know outside of that, you know, things are pretty good. So people could think of something above themselves. 
And what we classically see is when times get tough, people turn inwards. Mm-hmm. They become more protectionist. Uh, it, and it's not it's not right or wrong. It's just they've got to take care of their family. And the scarcity is kicked in. So mm-hmm. that will impact it. And so the, the question is often then, like if you said to someone, if you could invest ethically um, or responsibly or whatever word you want to use and get the exact same outcome, would you do it? People are going to say like nine times out of 10. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, so their fear is, but am I losing something to do this? And I think that's with the, that there's complexity in that side of the questionnaire. I think most people get stuck in the complexity of the, we're waiting for the client to say, I want nothing to do with uh, anything with the color red. And you've got to go through your portfolio, remove anything red. And it's like I, clients don't go there. Um, they just want guidance for things to be better. And if they can, if they can still retire comfortably and it's a different outcome. And mm, I think, true. yeah, it doesn't have to be a 99 out of 100 score then. It can just be, was it considered? Yeah, we do consider these things. Um, but at the end of the day, we want a, a well-balanced portfolio. Our philosophy is that ESG is important, but it should never be more important than the construction and asset allocation. So we don't go that. We will never remove an asset class. And if people go, great, I like you. I like your investment philosophy. Then I'll come on board with that. Um, which is where I go back to the investment philosophy sets the agenda so much. Um, yeah. You know, if if your internal view is we are neutral ESG, we offer the option. Um, you know, we, that's how we did it at Tribeca. We are neutral ESG. We give the option to the to the client, and they can make the decision. We don't care on the outcome. We just want to make sure they're comfortable. You could be positive, or you could be negative. You could be like, we don't do it here. If it's something you want, I'll refer out. So I think that's so much more important from a philosophical perspective, understanding the business's values, the ind- individual advisor's values to make sure they align as well, um, and for consistency of client experience to then enable that. And where you do come up with someone who does have those values or doesn't have them, if it doesn't align with you, you refer out to your great network of people that you've met at different events. Yeah. Yep. You've just helped me a lot there. <laughs> Yeah, like we have like like in a, in our business, like we we have an e, there's an ESG policy in the way that the portfolios are constructed, our model portfolios and whatever else. Like it, it it's there, we just don't ever talk about it with clients, unless someone really asks for it. Then we dig out the policy and say, look, we have got the policy, and we'll explain it, and we'll sit and share the policy with them. It's about when I'm getting to that particular question, articulating that we have a particular policy, and this is the view that we have. If you want something different to that, well, then we need to tailor that for you but mm. but outside of that our standard what we're going to do for you covers these kind of things yep. and they're Not largely going to be trusted good. by you yeah if, yeah if they say what do you think and you're like oh it's fine yeah. what do you think they're going to say because yeah. their trust has been built with their advisor and yeah. yes it's going to be people that like actually it's really important um and that's going to be demographic based that's going to be a referral base if you started talking a lot more about it um on on your tiktok channel i bet you the kind of people who are going to inquire are going to change yeah, definitely. um but i think it's yeah, it's it's not then right or wrong. Um, but it also plays to, um, I find it really interesting that, and, and the, the um, Report 779 from ASIC sort of highlighted this, a lot of advisors um, don't actually talk about why they recommend the investments they recommend. Um, so if they never bring up their philosophy at any stage, it's just assume we will do something with your super and here's our portfolio. And the SOA, uh, if you've ever done any compliance work, James, the SOA will say, like, here's why we recommend the the platform but yeah. nothing about the portfolio yeah. um what 779's very small um a scope of research found very small sample size was that the the, the advisors who actually built portfolios tended to explain that more than the advisors who didn't um it, that's what they found from their reports which i found really interesting but also positive um and and they address things like biases performance asset because it was part of the value proposition Advisors who go multi-asset index only don't tend to talk to that stuff because it, it's not what they do. It is still important to have that philosophical discussion with a client. This is how we invest. Here's some education. Here's information on on indexing and why we think it's the way to go. And if a client turns around and goes, I'm, I'm not comfortable with that, great, then we'll you know, refer out. But again, they're going to take your education and take it on board and take your professional advice because they built that trust with you. That's always going to be the leading factor, right? Yep. Nice. We might just leave it there. I think we could talk for hours. Or you, or you could. I, uh, <laughs> we could. <laughs> I know you've got a day to get on with your own business now and uh, ethos and, and everything else. Thank you for joining me again. Right, Catch up with you in person. Maybe in six months we can check in and see how I went. Some the, point the hypothesis. Yeah. Get you get you back on and see if it's uh, see if it's good or not. And uh, 
Uh, and I'm sure others will be keen to follow along. No, thanks for joining me. Where can, if anyone wants to follow your journey, where can they find you? Give yourself a bit of a plug. Oh, LinkedIn is always the way. Uh, I have a website now, nathanfradley.com.au. It's really weird. Uh, I want there, to remember. There's a, there's a photo of my dog uh, in the About Me section, he, being very cute. So if nothing else, check the dog photo out. Um, but yeah, LinkedIn is always the way. Thanks, Dave. Chat again soon.